Something that you need to go over and over and over again is the doctrines of salvation. These great words that really show you what you got when you got saved, when you believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. You're saved when you come to God as a guilty sinner and you believe on Him, what He did for you on the cross. He shed His blood. He died. He was buried and resurrected. You believe on that to get saved. And when you did that, all these great things happened. The first one I want to talk to you about is imputation. Imputation, I-M-P-U-T-A-T-I-O-N. That's where God charges my sin to Jesus Christ the moment I get saved. And not only that, he charges Jesus Christ's righteousness to me. Jesus Christ came down, lived a sinless life, did all the work that you would have to do to get saved if a man was to earn his salvation, Jesus Christ did every bit of work that would be required to earn your salvation and abstained from everything you would have to have to abstain from in order to keep it. So Jesus Christ did all the work. If salvation's by works, Jesus Christ is the one that did all the work and he's offering you his record that's got all the work done and he's going to charge that to your record if you believe on him. But look at Romans chapter 4 and verse 1 through 8. And we'll talk about this imputation. I'll show it to you in the Bible. It says, What shall we say then that Abraham our father, as pertaining to the flesh, hath found? For if Abraham were justified by works, he hath whereof to glory, but not before God. Before God, Abraham wasn't justified by works. For what saith the scripture? Abraham believed God, and it was, a, it was counted unto him. For righteousness. So Abraham believed God. Way back there in Genesis 15. God told Abraham. See the stars. Tell the stars if they'll be able to number them. So shall thy seed be. He believed the gospel about his seed. That his seed would be as the stars of the heaven. And he got righteousness imputed to him for believing. It says in verse 4. Now to him that worketh is the reward. Not reckoned of grace but of debt. But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. So before Abraham was circumcised, he got righteousness by believing what God said. Verse 6, Even as David also describeth the blessedness of the man, and to whom God imputeth righteousness without works. God gives you righteousness without you doing works the moment you get saved. You got the imputed righteousness of Jesus Christ without works, just by faith. He says, saying, Blessed are they whose iniquities are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Now look at this, Romans 4, 8. Imputation is not just God giving you his righteousness. It's him not imputing your sin to your record anymore. It says, Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. You see, if he's not, if he gave you Jesus Christ's righteousness, and that's on your record, and he's no longer going to put your unrighteousness, your sin on your record anymore to taint it again, then how can you lose your salvation? You can't. You got the imputed righteousness of Jesus Christ. You've got the imputation. Now, the next one, justification. With justification, God declared me righteous even though I'm not righteous. Look at Romans 5.1. It says, Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Justified by faith, not by works. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. God declared me righteous when I was not righteous. You know why? Because he took my bad record, nailed it to the cross, and gave me the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Now he can declare me righteous even though I'm not righteous. You see, God is the judge of all the earth. He can do what he wants to do. And you know, it says in 1 John 2, 1, it says, My little children, these things write I unto you that you sin not. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. Okay, imagine you're in a courtroom. The Father is the judge. 
you're over here and your lawyer is the Lord Jesus Christ, your advocate, the Lord Jesus Christ. But then over here, you got the devil who the Bible calls the accuser of the brethren. And he's telling the judge, he's telling the father about how guilty that you are and how you need to go to hell. You need to be in prison. But then the advocate jumps up and he's already got rid of the evidence. And he says, no, he doesn't need to go to hell. He's got my righteousness on his record. His record is spotless. There's nothing there. There's no sin there. He gets to go to heaven. He gets to spend eternity with the Lord. He gets to go into the millennium. He gets to go to New Jerusalem. Romans 5, 9 says, Much more than being now justified by his blood. Now, people lately, they've been bothering me you know, trying to attack me, saying, you know, you put too much emphasis on the blood. Now, you, the Bible puts the emphasis on the blood. It's not my fault that it keeps showing up. It says, being now justified by his blood, the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Acts twenty twenty eight calls it God, called it God's blood. So, you're justified. God declared you righteous. It says in Romans 3.20, Therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight. No flesh is going to be justified in his sight by keeping the law. Jesus already kept the law and gave you his righteousness and declared you righteous because you've got his righteousness. It says in Romans 3.28, Therefore, we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. Galatians 2.16, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ. Even we have believed in Jesus Christ, that we might be justified by the faith of Christ and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. How much clearer can it be? You got justified the moment you believed on Jesus Christ. At that moment, he declared you righteous. Didn't matter what the accuser of the brethren said. Now the next one is redemption. Redemption is the payment made by God to buy me back after I fell in sin when I reached the edge of accountability. Redemption is buying back. He's buying me back. He bought me. I'm his possession. In 1 Corinthians 6.19 it says, What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which you have of God, and ye are not your own? Verse 20, For ye are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and your spirit, which are God's. He bought me. You are his possession. He bought you. He purchased you with his own blood. It says, Look at Romans 7, 9. Paul says, for I was alive without the law once, but when the commandment came, sin revived and I died. So Paul says, I was alive without the law once. He's talking about before he, he reached the age of accountability, before he knew he was a sinner, before he knew that he had sinned against God, he was alive, he was safe. But when the commandment came, sin revived and I died. He said, I had not known sin Except thou hast said, thou shalt not covet. You know, he read, thou shalt not covet. He realized he had sinned against God. He realized he was a sinner. That's when he needed to be born again. So, redemption is the payment made by God to buy me back after I fell in sin at the age of accountability. See, before I realized I was a sinner, before I had that sin imputed to... But before I realized I was a sinner, the sin was not imputed to me. Without knowledge of the law, there's no transgression. You know, I have a, a, a four-year-old son. He doesn't understand yet. If he died right now, he's going to be with the Lord. He's not going to go to hell. Sin is not imputed to him yet. But one day he's going to read the scriptures. I'm going to keep reading him the scriptures. He's going to realize he's a sinner. And then, just like Paul said, I was alive without the law once, but when the commandment came, sin revived and I died. Then my son is going to need to be born again. He's going to realize he's a sinner. 
And when, when he gets born again, the Lord's going to redeem him. He's going to buy him back. He was in good standing with God. He's in good standing with God right now. Something's going to happen. He's going to realize he's going to he's going to realize he's guilty of sinning against God. He's going to have to be bought back. Now there's also the redemption of your body. Romans 8:23 it says and not only they but ourselves also which have the first fruits of the of the spirit even we ourselves grown within ourselves waiting for the adoption to wit the redemption of our body. Now that's at the rapture. You see your inner man saved your soul saved. It's the body that's not saved. The body's not born again. It's got to be made new. It's got to be changed. You're waiting for the redemption of your body. You're already saved. Ephesians 2, you're sitting together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, but you're just waiting on your body to be. You're waiting for the redemption of your body. Ephesians 1, 7, in whom we have redemption through his blood. There's the blood again. He bought you back with his blood. Ephesians 4.30 And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. The day that he comes back at the rapture and gives you a new body. And if you're sealed unto the day of redemption, you're sealed unto the rapture, you can't get unsealed, then how can you get unsaved, you see? If you've been redeemed... And the Lord bought you by his blood. He purchased you with his own blood. He's not putting you up for sale. The devil can't buy you back. So why do you think you can lose your salvation? You're not for sale. He's not putting you out there for sale. Imagine you take your kid that you, that you birthed into this world. Just like you were born again. Would you put him out there for sale? The Lord's not going to put you for sale. Now, the next one is propitiation. Now, propitiation has to do with the price paid to satisfy the demands of a holy God. You see, God isn't just a God of love. He's a God of wrath. And to both satisfy his love and his wrath at the same time, for God so loved the world, John 3, 16, that he gave his only begotten son. So, he, he loved you enough to come down and die on the cross for your sins. But how did he get the wrath appeased? How did he get uh, himself being a God of wrath? How did he get that satisfied? Well, you see, the Bible talks about a cup, the cup of God's wrath. And when Jesus Christ gave himself on the cross because he loved you, he also took the cup of wrath, poured it out on himself, and took all of his wrath on the sin of mankind on himself. That way he can appease his love and appease his wrath at the same time. And that is the propitiation. The price paid to satisfy the demands of a holy God. He has to have a payment on sin. It says in Romans 3.25, Whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood. Once again, the blood shows up. You believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, his shed blood on the cross. You get saved. He's the propitiation. The demand, the what it, the God needs to be sat, his wrath satisfied, and all the wrath on your sin was satisfied when you believed on Jesus Christ. Because he took your sin, he nailed it to the cross. He died for all of your sins on the cross. He's your propitiation. He satisfied the wrath of God. All the wrath of God that he had towards your sin was satisfied. In 1 John 2, 2, it says, And he is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. You see, you should be paying the payment. The wages of sin is death. Romans 6, 23. You should be paying for it. You should be feeling the wrath of God. But Jesus Christ took the wrath of God for you. He's the propitiation. The next one is regeneration. Regeneration is the act of the Holy Spirit entering into me at the time of salvation, taking up resident and sealing me with the Holy Ghost and making me born again. 
It says in Titus 3, 5, not by works of righteousness, which we have done. You see, obviously, it's not about works. It's not about the good you're doing and the bad you're doing. It's not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us. Mercy is God keeping you from something you deserve, which is hell. According to his mercy, he saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost. Now you think about that word regeneration. You see that word in there, gene, G-E-N-E, -E, regeneration. You got to get regenerated. Your first birth was bad. You were in Adam. And the Bible says in Adam all die. You see, Adam, the first man, he was made in the image of God, but he fell, he sinned, and lost the image. And now everybody after him has a sin nature. Your first birth is bad. You came out speaking lies. In sin did your mother conceive you. You had to get born again, regenerated. In 1 Peter one twenty three it says, being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the word of God which liveth and abideth forever. The first time, you, your first birth, you were born a corruptible seed. When you get born again, it's of incorruptible. And think about it like this. You can't go back in time and change the fact that you were born physically, right? You can't go back in time and make your mom never meet your dad and stop it. It happened. What happened, happened. You can't get unborn physically. Well, you can't go back in time to that night that you believed on Jesus Christ and talk yourself out of believing on Christ. What happened, happened. You can't go back in time and change it. And if you can't go back in time and change your physical birth, you can't go back in time and change your spiritual birth. Your first birth was a bad birth. You were in Adam. In Adam all die, but in Christ shall all be made alive. And the moment that you believed on Jesus Christ, you were born again, you were made alive. You can't go back and change it. You had a choice when it come to getting saved. But after you got saved, that choice is your choice. And trust me, I, I mean, I personally don't know anybody that wants to get unsaved, but... Trust me, the moment you, you get, like if you die right now, you go to the third heaven, you're not going to want to get unsaved. The next one is reconciliation. Reconciliation. What is reconciliation? Well, two opposing parties, me and God, those two parties were at enmity with each other. Before you were saved, you were the enemy of God. But those two parties are brought together, reconciled, and in peace because of Jesus Christ's death on the cross. Romans 5.10, it says, For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his Son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. When we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his Son. You were reconciled. You were an enemy of God. You got born again. Now you're a friend of God. You see, you're his son. You're his friend. You're in his body. He's in you. You're in him. The Bible likens us to his bride, Ephesians 5. You're so close to God. You, 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 are, you are in the Lord's body. You can't get separated. You've been reconciled. And the devil, no matter how, time, how many times he comes in there and accuses you, and says stuff about you that's not even true, it doesn't matter. God's not leaving you. It says in 2 Corinthians 5, 18, And all things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ, and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation. To wit, that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Colossians 1.21, And you that were sometime alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now hath he reconciled. You were an enemy. You're no longer an enemy. You've been reconciled. You ever had two friends that didn't like each other? 
that were enemies with each other and you bring them together. That way all three of you can be friends. That's what the Lord did. He took the Father's hand. He took your hand. He reconciled you. Now the next one is spiritual circumcision. And spiritual circumcision in Colossians 2.11 has to do with the moment that you got saved, God cut your soul loose from your flesh. It says in Colossians 2.11, And whom also ye are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands. That made without hands shows you this ain't, this ain't a regular circumcision. This is a spiritual circumcision. It's made without hands. Now look at this. And putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. Now, this isn't the circumcision of the heart. I'm talking about the spiritual circumcision that took place the moment you believed on Jesus Christ. Not like in the Old Testament where they circumcised their heart. I'm talking about the spiritual circumcision. God cut your soul loose from your flesh. You see, before you were saved, your soul was stuck to the flesh. So every time you this old nasty flesh sinned, that sin went on your soul too. And if you died like that, your soul had sin on it and it would have went to hell. But then you got born again. Your soul got washed in the blood of Jesus. Revelation chapter 1, unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. It was washed in the blood of Jesus. And you got the imputed righteousness of Jesus put on it. God put his righteousness on your record. And then he promised never to impute sin to you again. So your soul isn't stuck to the flesh. So anytime you sin in this old wicked flesh that's not saved yet, it's not tainting the soul. It's not touching the soul anymore. That's why you can go to heaven. That's why your sin doesn't make you lose salvation. Because you can't make your soul any more righteous than it already is, and you can't make it wicked again. You can't make it sinful again. You're a new creature. It's the inner man that's a new creature. It's not this flesh. You got the spiritual circumcision. If you got the spiritual circumcision, your soul's cut loose from your flesh, and the sins of the flesh aren't corrupting the soul anymore, how can you lose your salvation? You can't. Next, you got adoption. Romans 8.15 talks about it. The moment you got saved, you were adopted spiritually. It says in Romans 8.15, For you have not received the spirit of adoption again to fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. You got a new father. God the Father is your father if you've been born again. You've been born again. You've been adopted You've been reconciled, and you're going to get married to the Lord Jesus Christ. You are in the family. You are a member of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. Now, Romans 8.23 talks about the adoption when it comes to the body at the rapture. We're still waiting on that, but you were adopted the moment you believed the gospel when it comes to the what's on the inside, the inner man. The next one is sanctification. At salvation, you are set up for the work of God. At salvation. Sanctification means set apart. You know, in 2 Corinthians 6, 14 through 17, he, come, he says, come out from among them and be ye separate. You were sanctified once and for all the moment you believed God the moment you believed on Jesus Christ to save you, positionally, I got sanctified once and for all the moment I believed on Jesus Christ. Now, there's also a daily sanctification where each day I try to do right and live a sanctified life. But if I fell in doing that, my daily sanctification can never affect the fact that positionally I'm sanctified once and for all, set apart once and for all. The next one is remission. Now, remission is the payment for my sin has been made and now it's been accepted and applied. Matthew 26, 28, you got that great word remission. For this is my blood of the New Testament. 
which is shed for many for the remission of sins. Remission, the payment for my sin has been made and now it's been accepted and applied. That payment has been accepted and you, there's no, re, there's no refunds on it. You see, it's been, it's been paid. God can't say, you know, I don't, I don't want my blood to pay for that no more. The payment's been made. It's been accepted and applied. There's no taking it back. The next one is expiation. Now that word expiation is not in the Bible, but it's the principle of it is. Expiation is a purging or the burning out of my sin. And this took place on the crucifixion between the sixth and the ninth hour. You see, when Jesus Christ was on the cross, he took my hell when he was on the cross. He said, I thirst. And all the eternity of hell that I would have had to do was put on Jesus on the cross. And all the eternity of hell that you would have had to do was put on Jesus while he was on the cross. How is that possible? With God, all things are possible. See, Jesus already took the punishment for your sins. He already took your hell. So what makes you think you're going to have to burn for them again? You see? He's your expiation. He's, he took the punishment for you. He already, he already took the punishment for your sin. So if you were to die and go to hell, those sins would be getting paid for twice. You ever heard of double jeopardy where you can't be tried for the same crime two times, you see? You, you know... If the sin's already been paid for, the punishment's already been done for those sins, what makes you think you're going to have to go back and get them paid for again? You see, all the sins that you've ever committed in your life were future sins when Jesus was dying for them on the cross. It says in 1 Peter 3.18, For Christ also once suffered for sins. The, he just had to pay for them one time. That was it, and it's over. But now the last one, glorification. And this is the one I've been telling you about when you get a new body, Romans 8, 23. This is your glorification. And not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves grown within ourselves, waiting for the adoption to wit, the redemption of our body. Your glorification is when you get a new body at the rapture and your, your body's saved. Romans 8.18, For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. Your glorification. You see, you need a new body that is saved because your flesh is not saved. Your flesh is not born again. It doesn't match the new creature on the inside that is born again. If your flesh is born again or good enough to keep your salvation, then why do you think you got to get a new body? You know, Paul said, O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? Paul knew the body was bad. He knew the inner man was good. So he said in uh, 2 Corinthians 5, and all things are of God, talking about the inner man, the new creature. But he knew the old man, the, this old body is, is vile. He says, our vile body is, She'll be fashioned like unto his glorious body, the glorification. But that's the doctrines of salvation. Go back over them. Write them down. Listen to this again. Get those doctrines of salvation in your mind because there's going to come a time where the devil is going to come to you and say, you're not really born again. And you're going to want to know, am I really born again? Am I really saved? Go over these doctrines of salvation and you'll find out you can't lose your salvation because salvation has nothing to do with what you're doing. It's all about what the Lord Jesus Christ did.